Hello, welcome back. I now want to talk to you about a special class of transfer functions, or actually two special classes, that are called the positive real transfer functions and the strictly positive real transfer functions. So today we're just going to be talking about transfer functions g um, of the form, so we have si minus a inverse b. So this is just a normal scalar transfer function, something like 1 over s plus 1 or whatever we want here. Um, s cubed plus s plus 1, and we can put we could put a plus s squared up here. So as uh, transfer functions like this, um, and we want to talk about what makes a transfer function positive real or strictly positive real. And um, these two classes of transfer function have very close connections to the idea of passive systems. So these are systems that um, have no internal energy sources, but can only either conserve or dissipate energy. And these types of transfer functions are going to build a bridge to the energy functions or the Akhenov functions that we were investigating before. And it's through this class that we're going to be able to prove um, something that's called the passivity theorem, which will then uh, be able to extend to prove the circle criterion. Uh, but today we're just going to talk about um, passive systems, so uh, strictly positive real and positive real transfer functions. So we're talking about transfer functions, and imagine that these are sort of transfer functions for um, systems with no internal um, sources of energy. So maybe we've got a mass connected to all by a damper. We have some external force which can provide input to our system, but nothing internal to this setup will provide energy, and we'll uh, illustrate the definitions through this. Um, so what are the positive real and the strictly positive real functions? Well, the positive real, so g, g of s is positive real if um, the following two criteria hold. The first is that g of s is marginally stable. So this means all uh, its poles have to be in the left half plane, but you're allowed imaginary axis poles as long as they're simple. So we can have simple imaginary axis uh, poles. So we have to have this, and then we have to have this other rather strange uh, looking property, and that is that the real part of the frequency response of G has to be bigger than zero for all positive frequencies. So this is the definition of a positive real function, and G of s is said to be strictly positive real if a pair of very similar criteria hold, and the first is that G of s is asymptotically, asymptotically stable, and now we have the strict version of this, and also that the real part of g of j omega is greater than zero. For omega greater than or equal to zero. Um, so this looks a bit weird and a bit abstract. Um, we can actually give a nice graphical interpretation of what this means, and maybe you already start to be seeing some kind of connections to the graphical um, nature of the circle criterion. So what does this weird second requirement mean graphically? Well, we have some picture of the complex plane. We see that the frequency response has to lie in the right half plane, or the Nyquist diagram has to lie in the right half plane. So there's like, we just, the left half plane is now banned um, from the perspective of uh, Nyquist diagrams. So um, the function is positive real, as long as we always, as well as long as we're marginally stable and our Nyquist diagrams always lie in the right half plane, but we're allowed to touch um, the imaginary axis. So we're imagining this corresponds to zero frequency. This is the Nyquist plot of g of j omega, and it, if it goes something like this, this would be an example of a Nyquist diagram that is positive real and 
Strictly positive real is very similar, it's just we're not allowed to touch um, the imaginary axis now for positive frequencies. You are allowed to come into the origin still, but for all other frequencies, you have to be um, strictly away. So this would be, um, for example, this would be an example of something that's strictly positive real. And this one here, this, this one is positive real. So that's what these mean, and we were sort of claiming um, that this has got some connection to the notion of systems without any energy dissipation. So we'll just check whether uh, the system here is um, positive real or strictly positive real and um, just see what happens. We won't rigorously justify the claim that these correspond to the passive systems. Um, so first of all, what should the output of this system here? Well, we have to think about units to determine this. So energy is a physical quantity and um, energy is equal to the integral of um, power over time. And how could we write power in terms of the units here? So if Q is our position, then Q dot is our velocity. So the pow power has got the units of velocity times force. So um, we're going to describe this as an input-output system from force to uh, velocity. And what happens if we put this in a transfer function from force to velocity? Well, if I take um, the class transforms here, I get m s squared plus c s or multiplied by q is equal to f. And so that implies that Q dot, so this is now the Laplace transform of Q dot is equal to S over M S squared plus C S times force, and this is equal to 1 over M M S plus C. So what does the Nyquist diagram of this thing look like? Uh, well, when S is equal to um, 0, it's 1 over c, so we have 1 over c, and then as s goes to infinity, we have a phase that comes in at minus uh, 90, and actually it's just a perfect semicircle here. So the Nyquist diagram of this system is a semicircle, and so it's strictly positive real, as long as c is not equal to zero. So as long as we have some source of en energy dissipation, our, trans our corresponding transfer function is strictly positive real. When c is equal to zero, this is equal to one over ms, and then the Nyquist diagram just looks like this here. So it's just an integrator. And that meets the condition here. It's marginally stable. We've got one pole at the origin, but it's simple, so we're marginally stable. And the real part of the Nyquist diagram is greater than or equal to zero. So it satisfies um, the positive real condition, but it fails uh, both of the strictly positive real conditions. And if C is equal to zero, we have no damper. And so our system still doesn't have any internal energy source, but it's what's called lossless. And um, so passive systems that do not dissipate energy correspond to positive real transfer functions, and if they have some energy dissipation in them, uh, they'll become strictly positive real. Um, so how can how do we connect this to what we're seeing so far? Well, we're actually already seeing an extreme case of the circle criterion, and this is corresponding to the case that our sector, our nonlinearity is lying in the following sector here. So we get our slope k1 is infinite, and our slope k2 is equal to zero. So our 1 over k1 point is here, our 1 over k2 point is off to infinity, and the circle that we have to draw correspond, gives us this entire forbidden region here. Um, so we're sort of starting to see that if we have these systems that dissipate energy, it somehow corresponds to the circle criterion um, but with these extreme values of the slope. Well, what we're now going to start to do is 
tie this notion of energy dissipation to these ideas of um, the Apollo functions that we saw before, and then work out how to manipulate this picture in order to transform this um, into the more general version of the circle criterion that we saw, where we could have different values of the slope. Thank you.